So I know I've spoken a lot about Einstein's relativity over the past like month or something. It's been a long time. It's been a long journey because we're following Einstein's path to developing general relativity and then the test that came out of that, out of all his imaginings. And the final theory though, the equations that we have that we use to describe general relativity that Einstein finally developed in 1917, it's kind of hard to go from the raw thought experiments that he had to the full theory, the actual mathematics. And that's why the thought experiments are incredibly useful for getting us thinking in the right direction. But physics isn't just thought experiments. Uh, no offense to any philosophers out there, but, but this is one of the things that separates or extends physics from pure philosophy, which is we don't just think of scenarios and argue about it. We actually have to develop rigorous mathematics with logical proofs and then go and test that against the reality. And in this case, uh, I noticed a lot of questions that you guys had, which are great about some of the nuances of the thought experiments, but don't don't worry too much about the thought experiments because those are just to kickstart your brain to get you in the right direction. The actual physical theory can now, you know, almost or over a hundred years later, can be developed just from mathematics, from taking a few simple assumptions about the way the universe works and working through the mathematical consequences of that and developing the full equations of general relativity. And But I wanted to follow Einstein's path because Einstein's path is so powerful and has all these beautiful images and pictures and mental scenarios that get you in the right frame of thought. So I'm going to give you another argument, another line of reasoning that develops general relativity from very basic principles. And it's easier to understand this line of thinking after you've done all the Einstein stuff. And this line of thinking starts with the equivalence principle. The equivalence principle, and I know I've said this in previous videos and I'm going to say it again, the equivalence principle is perhaps the most important, not perhaps, I'm going to go for it. It is the most important cornerstone of general relativity. It's what makes general relativity work. It's how we are able to proceed, how we are to take special relativity and the concepts and the theorems and the predictions encoded in the mathematics of special relativity. You add this one ingredient called the equivalence principle and that's how you get general relativity. And the equivalence principle is that your inertial mass, the, the oomph it takes to move you, how much effort it takes to move an object, the inertial mass, is the exact same thing as the gravitational mass, how well an object responds to a gravitational field. It's, it's gravitational charge, if you will, as analogy to electrical charge. Once you assume that these two things are identical, you can whip up the mathematics, and you can whip up some scenarios that get you to the full picture of general relativity. And in this example, I want you to imagine orbiting the Earth. You're an astronaut or a cosmonaut or whatever not, and you're gonna you're gonna do a test. You have a box with a bunch of stuff, and it's random. It's nuts and bolts and leftover bits of food and you know all, all sorts of junk in this box. And you open up the box and you let the junk float out. Now, this is like totally dangerous and a hazard to navigation in Earth orbit. We're going to ignore that part. That's someone else's problem. We do, we're doing a thought experiment here, so it's all okay. All these bits and pieces have different masses, right? Some might be microscopic. Some might be, you know, a wrench, a space wrench, you know, this big, nice and nice and massive. Because of the equivalence principle, and this is totally unique to the force of gravity, because of the equivalence principle, these objects, no matter their mass, will faithfully trace out the gravitational field of the Earth. You don't have to worry about anything else. You can just watch them 
and watch their trajectories. And that will tell you what the gravitational field of the earth is. It will tell you about gravity directly without having to fold in anything else. Now, as you watch, notice what happens. Let's say you have four, you see four objects, four little pieces of junk, all with different masses, but the masses don't matter because of the equivalence principle. And they, they start off perfectly in line horizontally like this, and they all start falling to the earth. Well, they'll fall down, right? Going towards the earth. But they're not just going down, they're going down and a little bit in because the gravitational, the attraction of the earth points towards the center, right? It's just a little bit, it's just a little bit, but you're really good at observing because this is a thought experiment. So instead of just going straight down like this, you'll watch, they, they steadily come closer together. And eventually their paths will intersect at the center of the earth if they could actually reach the center of the earth, but they can't, but it doesn't matter. You can watch their paths intersect. So things that are initially parallel end up converging. Now take four different bits, so totally, totally different. Now, now this clump over here that's, that's falling in orbit or floating in orbit over here. Instead of four horizontal bits, you have four vertical bits and you don't care about their masses, it doesn't matter. Four vertical bits that are all evenly spaced and they're gonna fall to earth like this. But the one that's closest to the earth already gets a slightly stronger gravitational pull, right? Because it's a little bit closer. It's gravitational force exerted on is just a tiny bit stronger than the guy up here. So this one's going to accelerate a little bit faster. And then this one's going to lag behind and lag behind. And then finally, this one's going to catch up. So things that start off close together as they fall spread apart. Their paths diverge. So check this out. In these two cases, we have paths that are initially parallel, but end up either converging or diverging. What is that? That is geometry. That is the definition of a curved geometry, where paths that start out parallel end up converging or diverging. So just from the equivalence principle, you can follow this little thought experiment and you realize, you recognize that gravity must be related to curvature. They must be connected because you're watching paths of objects converge and diverge. This is the mathematics of Riemann and Gauss and others developed in the mid 1800s what we call non-Euclidean geometry, Riemannian geometry, curved geometry. These are the extensions of Euclid's flat geometry that we all learned in high school, extensions to curved surfaces. And you're watching something being curved. You're watching paths diverge and converge. Geometry must be at the root of this. And so just from the equivalence principle in this little thought experiment, you realize that gravity is curvature because what's being curved here? Well, the only thing between these objects and the earth is space time itself. That's what's carrying gravity. That's providing the substructure. So the same substance, and I hesitate to use that word, but, but you get my drift. The same substance that provides the stage for special relativity this coordinate system is the exact same thing that's bending and flexing, providing the geometry for gravity. So this is how we learn that gravity is the curvature of space-time. That matter tells space-time how to bend, just like the presence of the Earth is what's driving the motion of all these little test particles. So... And if all the little test particles are following geometries of space-time, the geometry of space-time must have been affected by the presence of the planet Earth. So mass and energy bend and warp and flex space-time, and then the bending and warping and flexing of space-time tells matter how to move. That is general relativity. Now, you have to do that a lot more carefully and in a lot more details to actually develop the equations, the hideous, hideously difficult equations of general relativity. We're talking 10 equations, nonlinear, all coupled together. So they depend on each other in very complicated, non-trivial ways. 
the equations of general relativity are so complicated that when people are able to find solutions to the equations of general relativity, they become famous in their own right and they get the solution named after it. That's how complicated these equations are. But even though they're ferociously difficult mathematically, they are elegant in their conception. They very nicely, compactly describe this, the nature of this very, very subtle force and the nature of motion. And it's amazing. It's amazing that you can go from relatively simple statements like the equivalence principle, follow it through relatively simple thought experiments like watching test particles float, fall to earth, and arrive at something so powerfully descriptive. That is general relativity. Thank you so much for watching. Please hit the like button and don't forget to hit the notification button. I go live every week on Space Radio, so make sure you want to get notified. Go to Patreon to help support the creation of all these shows. And I don't know, tell your friends or something that this show is awesome. I appreciate it. See you next time.